to be Jianong Feng from the Center for Nanoscale Systems at uh, Harvard University, which, oh. <laughs> <laughs> which I understand is a very large user base. Um, so you'll be talking about um, those challenges. Thank you. I think you're learning about the play uh, the song is okay? Okay, good. Um, uh, th uh, thank you. Uh, thanks to Yong and uh, Ben and uh, uh, Chris for the invitation. Uh, let me uh, have a chance to uh, come up here. And also, it's a great you know, honor to uh, always a great honor have uh, have a chance to work with uh, you know the uh, colleagues and uh, listen to my uh, my colleagues to learn some uh, experience uh, outside. And um, uh, like, like this morning, so I would say the uh, Dennis, you know. <laughs> The, the after the Dennis' you know, presentation, I would say uh, physics and uh, mathematics always works, right? <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> great. Um, so, uh, you and I have a uh, lot of uh, discussion in the past years uh, after he uh, joined uh, Yale, and uh, I kind of always amazed, you know, uh, Yale, uh, all, uh, all the progress you know, Yale uh, have made. I would say this uh, step today is a big, uh, big leap for the Yale, to basically uh, trying to uh, to build the new facility for the future. I say uh, lots of uh, work uh, o o over there, but uh, I say that's a bit of well, open up the, the, the bright future. And for us, for the in, in Harvard CS, okay, look, when we look back, we are not like uh, new at the uh, at the world. It's kind of a 15 years old in the in the room, and uh, so we pass all those. Uh, Procedures, you know, from the, the, the small lab and uh, build the uh, genome, a new genome, new center, and then install, you know, uh, set it down, and then uh, expand it. Okay, that's we we also struggle in lots of uh, issues and uh, will take a while, but I'm pretty sure uh, you will be able to get. Okay, so when uh, uh, you and I discussed uh, uh, this uh, seminar, so. Um, Okay, the the the, the subject topic is kind of uh, being built how to build the uh, clean room. Uh, so uh, uh, in my talk, basically, I uh, I will change the tone a little bit and uh, more focus on the user side, how to expand our user base, how to expand uh, uh, <coughs> expand our capability, and uh, basically how to build up a team and uh, uh, try to satisfy you know a large user base like uh, we are talking about one uh, one of the users. Right, so here, uh, <coughs> with that uh, in, my, uh, <coughs> in our mind, actually, it, it, uh, my talk. Uh, all right, the first of all, I, uh, <coughs> I will give you the, the brief uh, overview of uh, CNS and uh, show you some uh, the fabrication uh, steps. And then I will focus on three. Uh, uh, what is the fabrication capability expanding? Basically, we want to, uh <coughs> you need to provide uh, technical Enemies and the flexibility to perform large uh, use space. The second is will be uh, another fact uh, operation uh, priorities, basically how to provide the solid and efficient support. Okay, from uh, the third is uh, scientific thing and the impact basically uh, what how we uh, support you know research group with uh, professional and the unique uh, technical uh, solutions. Right. So that's a <coughs> now here. Um, that's the overview of CS. CS basically is a shared research center, uh, open not only for Harvard uh, people, but also outside academic and also industry people, right? The our main mission is uh, uh, enable <coughs> next generation uh, uh, science. Uh, more specifically, is to support uh, the research and the development for uh, different materials, for new, new materials and device. Technically, we have uh, two uh, technical uh, teams. Uh, well, what's net, net fabrication basically how to make the, the device. Second so is uh, uh, imaging. So we uh, provide the uh, advanced you know, uh, imaging tools, the TM tools for the characterization and uh, uh, analysis. And uh, now this is our center. Okay, so uh, basically it's a four uh, floors, you know, center underneath. Okay, so uh, it's, uh, it's here. And uh, uh, the, the basic uh, uh, original idea is uh, we, we try to include all the uh, nerve science and technology activities in one building. Uh, one building, uh, building is, is called the laser building. So basically, in this uh, center, we have a clinical uh, imaging, uh, cell center, culture uh, lab, and uh, software developer field lab, and uh, uh, optical lab, and uh, uh, SPNs. Right. Recently, 
recently, two years ago during the pandemic, uh, we opened an, another branch in uh, engineering building across the river in Austin. And uh, so uh, in that building, we have several you know, images and material labs. Uh, right now, it's not, in, uh, not fully uh, occupied and uh, used up yet. And currently, uh, the whole center, okay, so we uh, have about uh, 1,700 you know, uh, users, and it uh, include the, the image and the uh, uh, flag. Okay, so this is uh, in uh, 2019, the real number is 1,754, right? And uh, in that year, so generate about uh, almost 200,000 uh, 200, uh, uh, usage, right? So the user uh, type, 55% uh, come from the harbor and uh, about 30% uh, from uh, uh, outside the academic, like uh, MIT, uh, Tufts, and the BU, and U UMass, even Duke. Um, <coughs> uh, so, and about, well, also we have about 15% uh, users from uh, industry, uh, small and uh, big uh, universities. And the user discipline wise is uh, very uh, broad. Say uh, materials and the physics and the uh, economic uh, side and the life science. Used ten years ago, Harvard predicted that you know, life science is uh, always a take big portion, and but uh, here it was uh, uh, still a quarter, and we still have a very active you know, life science research going on. And now more details about uh, another application. Okay, so uh, another fabrication uh, uh, side is, uh, okay, uh, again, uh, try to provide all the different kind of uh, technical solutions for different, uh, different you know, uh, materials and, and uh, device. Uh, and uh, now we have a 10,000 square feet in room, class 100 and class 1,000, and uh, support uh, 170 you know, pieces uh, piece of equipment. And we have about uh, uh, 15 you know, technical staff uh, plus some uh, uh, intern and uh, uh, postdocs. So basically, uh, this clean room, this nerve fabrication, originally set up as a, not like uh, CMOS in the style, basically we open to uh, non-traditional you know, materials, silicon, uh, three-point materials, you know, uh, polymers and stuff. And also we kind of uh, provide the unconventional and uh, frontier process you know, uh, platform. And basically, we are uh, we are kind of component uh, component in the driven uh, uh, site. Okay, it's a kind of good concept and uh, all the fundamental research. Okay, we are not you know uh, you, uh, the the, the, the pre-production is not our goal. <coughs> so uh, current, uh, after 2016, our uh, user number in the clean room over is over uh, 1,000 uh, yeah, users. And uh, the two uh, usage is over uh, 100, uh, 140 in a thousand hours. Uh, hour. So from that uh, that point of view, is uh, I I've said this clean room is one of the busiest in the clean room in the academic uh, side. Uh, here is it. Well, but if you look at the uh, uh, last uh, uh, last century, the uh, 25 years ago, okay, uh, the situation is not this way. And uh, uh, in Harvard. In Harvard, 1999, before 1999, we don't have a very good, we didn't have a very good, you know, uh, uh, clean room. Only one tiny clean room is 1,500 uh, square feet, right? It's uh, under a uh, uh, senior pro professor, Professor Tinkins in the lab. And that time, we could only uh, make some simple uh, device. Of course, at that time, we're, we're pretty, pretty good at the soft material side and the uh, fabrication. But the uh, uh, tailoring, huge, you know, technical gap it, it exists uh, uh, at that time. Several faculties uh, realized uh, that this gap and they tried to, you know, uh, 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 basically three of them, uh, three of the, uh, uh, our founder, uh, Linky, Bob Westville, and uh, Josh Weissack. They kind of uh, form, uh, form up a proposal and convince the school to invest and form this, uh, uh, the core uh, facility is called the CIMS, uh, Center for Imaging and uh, Mesoscale Scale Scale Structure. Apparently, at that time, the imaging we are pretty, uh, relatively good, okay, but uh, the clean room is, uh, is bad, I'd say. We, uh, also, we got a kind of first, uh, you know, startup, you know, about nine, nine million, and uh, they divide into two parts, <coughs> uh, uh, and we built a, a not, uh, another small, tiny clean rooms in the basement, okay, about 10,000 square feet, and uh, 
So that's how we just have about less than one, uh, 100 users. Now, with the uh, same uh, proposal, uh, <coughs> the school is in, in about one, 150 million to build a new building. And uh, that's a 2004 uh, break, uh, breaking. And uh, also uh, gave uh, to, uh, 30 million in uh, capital uh, funds. So basically, one third go to the another side. Okay, so that's a, <coughs> that's a picture. Construction and then take about two, uh, take about uh, three, uh, three years, and the uh, whole building uh, build up. And okay, that's the, the nuclear room over, uh, over here. And then uh, we start to move, uh, with the, uh, move the tools uh, in and then store the uh, tools in. It will take about well, uh, we don't have uh, uh, originally we don't uh, we don't have that many you know tools. Uh, uh, basically, about uh, fifty pieces or uh, okay, easily uh, move in are not very complicated. In the tools, and uh, the, we take uh, take about two, uh, three, three months and move in each transaction. It, uh, pretty uh, smooth, and uh, also uh, start to uh, attract the new users and uh, uh, initiate the new uh, trainings. Right. So we also uh, hire uh, more staff uh, that time mainly on the equipment side. Now after that, so we kind of set it down and install and uh, uh, deal with a lot of uh, you know. Shop, uh, the, the issues, you know, uh, uh, during the, the, the construction, and uh, finally, <coughs> uh, well, I I I, uh, I joined in uh, Harvard in two thousand and four, basically uh, before the uh, before the we uh, moved into the new the new building, the new building, and the two thousand ten basically okay after that, so, so we finally sit, sit down, and then the, the base is already built, built up, and then we moved to. Let's say uh, focus on the, the, the interface with uh, the research site, and then try to attract m uh, more, uh, more uh, users, and then uh, satisfy the research uh, demand. Now, <coughs> then we kind of uh, uh, change our structure, and uh, all, uh, in the especially the clinical side, and uh, we can uh, uh, build the maintenance space and uh, establish the baselines, and uh, also the uh, change the new uh, training protocol. Okay. Uh, uh, at the same time, we continue, you know, fill up the technical gap. Okay. So then, after that, we kind of move to here. Uh, the, the, uh, this phase, basically, after uh, after about uh, more than ten years, uh, more than ten years, you know, ca uh, catching up, and we reach that uh, that point. Okay. So we uh, are capable to uh, open more, you know, a uh, process, and then enable uh, more, you know, uh, research uh, in uh, in this uh, uh, fab. And also that the, the our uh, user numbers you know reached one thousand. Basically, our char uh, the charge becomes like uh, how to deal with a big user uh, pool, uh, community and uh, how to you know uh, develop and uh, the uh, work with uh, the frontier the process of development to with the research uh, side. Okay, so that's a, a different you know phase. So uh, look back, uh, actually we take uh, took about a uh, well. However, it basically start very low, very weak in the base, and we took about uh, ten years to fill up this uh, kind of technical uh, gap. Okay, it will take a while, and uh, now I think it is uh, based on Matt and uh, 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 other speakers' you know, uh, presentation. Is it sounds sounds like it's much short, shorter? Now here is some of the data of uh, user numbers uh, from two thousand four to two thousand twelve, and here. Uh, in the 2012, 2012, we already reached 1,000, but this is the total number of CNS. And, uh, CNS. and for the uh, nanofab, at, at this point, we uh, about take about 60%. Okay. And then after uh, that, now there's a current you know, uh, data, uh, 2019, uh, the, the total number is uh, 1754. Now, uh, beside the, the user number, I'm more interested in the usage, uh, the tool uh, usage, how busy, you know, uh, how, uh, how busy the tool uh, has been uh, used. Right. In, in this uh, chart, basically, tell you more uh, story. Okay, so there's uh, apparently three stage, uh, stages, right? The first stage be, uh, before 2007, okay, be, uh, basically, uh, it's before we really uh, moved into the new uh, building and uh, the, uh, that usage is pretty low, okay. So 
So matter of fact, the Kino only contribute about 40% of uh, uh, fuel usage. It's about that every month is only uh, 1,000 you know, uh, hours. And after we move into the clean room, a uh, new, new clean room, uh, and uh, the, the usage the, uh, gradually uh, grown up, and then uh, none of that goes back, back to the, uh, you uh, take about 50% of the usage. And now uh, after uh, 2010, we kind of restructure our uh, manufacturing and also uh, apply the new operation modes. And uh, after that, so you see the usage jump to another level. Okay, here is uh, more data is after uh, uh, 2011. Here is the, as a monthly, uh, every monthly the usage of the, uh, the lab is e easily go. Uh, now at this point, uh, 2016, okay, the user number uh, reach 1,000. Uh, the, the usage is about uh, one third, uh, two thirds of the total uh, usage. So, <coughs> the organization on the side is basically we, uh, in the past 20, uh, let's say 20 years, we changed many, many times as a current uh, uh, the structure. And the matter of fact, and the uh, imaging uh, under uh, plus the uh, admin side under uh, Dr. Bill Wilson's you know, guidance. Uh, Bill, you know, joining uh, Harvard 2015, and also we have a scientific director uh, Bob Blesswell, who is uh, one of the three founders of uh, CNS. Okay, so that's uh, that, that, uh, that, that's great, and also we have a uh, adv uh, advisory you know, committee to help us to make the uh, uh, the technical strategic uh, you know, uh, decision. And the whole uh, clean, uh, I would say, the CNS is under the FS, you know, in office. Uh, actually, the CS also, you know, contribute about fifty percent of the budget, you know. Uh, <coughs> so. Now, uh, let's uh, back to the, the, the clean room. Okay, here is the original clean room layout. Okay, here is the ground uh, ground floor, and the uh, the yellow uh, area is our clean room. Totally is. Um, we call the uh, 10,000 square feet, basically is here is about uh, 9,600, uh, including the trays. And uh, that size is not very big, honestly. The real working, working uh, clean uh, area uh, size is about six, uh, 6,500, okay? And we have uh, this area saved for the ex uh, future expansion, but unfortunately we never make that happen because it's all fully occupied and uh, the school <laughs> you know, approved uh, approve that the proposal to that us to be expanded. Uh, we still fighting, uh, fighting uh, for that. And uh, this corner uh, originally uh, saved for the material synthesis you know, uh, area for the factory design, but uh, we kind of failed uh, several times uh, to, to hire a uh, new faculty in that area, but uh, recently we managed to take that uh, take over uh, this place for the 2D material assembly lab. And uh, uh, this place is our uh, SPM uh, room, and recently we, we uh, exchanged with, uh, uh, changed the, uh, the space with uh, another faculty uh, downstairs. Now we have a computer rooms over here, and then this is the office of four for staff. So more details of uh, the clean, uh, clean room. Okay, that's the original uh, setting for layout. Uh, when we move in 2007, divide into like the six uh, bays for uh, uh, EDL uh, bay, uh, the charge bay, photo bay, web bay, and dry and the uh, PVD bay. And so when we move all those uh, 60 pieces of equipment in, okay, we feel it's uh, empty, it's about uh, one third you know, occupied. We feel, okay, we have enough in the space to expand. But uh, now it's basically uh, occupied everywhere. And uh, we even move all those uh, charge tools against this uh, window hallway. All right, so um, let me give you a, uh, we, we uh, made a, some uh, virtual tool. So you can see what the going on, uh, what we have inside the clean room. Uh, somebody can help. So 
well, during the epidemic, okay, so not uh, um, many traffic uh, build uh, make the, this kind of virtual tool and allow you. Okay, so we, let's go inside. Uh, how, uh, let's see. Okay, that's our uh, video. Okay, now let's uh, go into the EV lithography room. Inside we have a three uh, electronics. Okay, so this one is a 50 kV system, and uh, this is a uh, 125 kV system, and this one is an old uh, 100 kV system. So recently we just moved this out and uh, to replace another new uh, 150 kV system. So it will be here uh, the next uh, two weeks uh, later, right? And then let's go outside. You see here. Um, then it's, and you don't, don't feel the surprise if you see this, not, uh, this tool. It's uh, not another Fraser from the Heidelberg. And uh, that's before uh, we move uh, into your, uh, your site. Basically, that, that Heidelberg they put a, a, a outer system in our lab for demo. And uh, unfortunately, in the, uh, within two years, we haven't, uh, haven't generated enough you know, usage. So basically, we moved to uh, and, uh, one of the uh, MIT Faculties feel is uh, useful for the research, but basically we uh, moved out there. And you see here, uh, that's our, uh, originally is a web process space, but uh, it's occupied with some uh, <coughs> other SCNs and uh, uh, the surface in the treatment tools. So you see, uh, basically I want to show you here, uh, okay, you, you, can, uh, you can click the, the button and you can, uh, see all the details of that tool. So basically, well, this uh, link is uh, open uh, public. You can go to uh, CNS and uh, get more uh, information. But the reason I want to show over here, you see uh, our space is uh, fully occupied. We don't have any space put in uh, any, uh, the new, uh, new tools in. A anytime, if we want to put new equipment, we have to replay, uh, retire some uh, old, uh, old tool. So, uh, Okay, basically we have, we are in the kind of, um, in the uh, space war. Every moment we kind, of, uh, we kind of use any kind of chance to fight with the school and try to get more space, right? So that's a big task for, uh, for us uh, within five years. All right, um, now to give you more, uh, our uh, uh, technology uh, capability expanded. Okay. Uh, let's say 15 years ago, before we moved into the uh, new building, we have a few, like uh, this, for example, the, the lithography side, we have a few tools. Okay, we have a simple, uh, I won't say simple, simple, the first, you know, the RAIS 150 uh, uh, EDL system, and uh, we have a TBL. Oh, that's a, oh, that is Joe. And we have uh, okay, we uh, uh, we have uh, 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 for the mass uh, uh, rider, and then after that we kind of add more uh, tools in. So at this point uh, we have about uh, three uh, five uh, EBL system over here. One the special one is uh, this uh, 50 kV system. So that's a uh, uh, drip uh, <coughs> proposed by by a faculty uh, Picasso group. So because they uh, heavy. Uh, involve the metal lens. They need. Uh, they make the uh, sample bigger and bigger. They need a very uh, fast, you know, high throughput, uh, high, high, uh, high throughput you know, uh, e uh, you know, uh, writer. And also another uh, uh, source is uh, uh, pushing is from uh, the house, uh, like a Marcos group and the photonics side. <coughs> okay. Basically, uh, for the the uh, side, side, patterning side is kind of they become a strong or core uh, facility in uh, CNS. And basically, you can find all those uh, resolution from a uh, few nanometers to few uh, uh, microns and uh, uh, millimeter, and uh, to, uh, from 2D to 3D uh, 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 writing. Okay, so <coughs> another area we is uh, etching, and again, here is the 2000 uh, before 2006. 
and we, well, when I uh, joined Harvard, kind of disappointed me a lot. Because, uh, at that time, only had <coughs> two uh, working RIEs. One is South Bay, very simple, and another is uh, uh, next uh, uh, ECR, you know, uh, actually. And uh, there is no process control, is uh, a very dirty chamber, and they don't, they don't expect that you can get a consistent uh, action rate. And it, well, uh, and up now, what we have is uh, here, and basically we have, uh, for different materials, we have uh, uh, several, uh, one, uh, one, uh, several tools to cover that area. For example, we have silicon, we have three, we have dedicated uh, uh, tools for the diamond uh, etching, and uh, uh, this one, is dedicated for the uh, deep oxide etcher and uh, uh, mainly for uh, not uh, seventy percent is to use for the digital lavate in the etching. And uh, metal etching is like the uh, ID here, uh, also used for not only for metal but also used uh, for the diamond uh, process. So the the in, uh, unique part is uh, we allow some uh, very unique in the process uh, here. Uh, for example, this is a diamond uh, process used. Uh, uh, Friday cage. Maybe the uh, CNS is the first inside that allow people to uh, carry, uh, put this kind of uh, Friday cage in, in the art chamber, right? And with that, you, they can make uh, this kind of cantilever, you know, uh, structure for uh, which is essential for the uh, uh, emitters and uh, emitters and uh, uh, web guys. Well, I, uh, I will uh, talk about more, uh, more details uh, later on, and uh, well, we have we have some other you know uh, you know etching uh, uh, you know, uh, capabilities. To now the film side, uh, originally we are also okay, not not too not too bad. We have several you know, uh, thermal evaporator, uh, evaporator and the events, but not much. But the, uh, especially the LPCVD piece still is is very 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 poor. And one of, the, uh, one of the example is LBCD. When I joined there, there is uh, a LBCD uh, 10 by 10 uh, feet and uh, very bulky and only for one wafer, single wafer process. And the, the, the uh, cost is about uh, what uh, they said is about one million. But I don't know how they you know, pass back acquisition uh, justification. But uh, uh, it's also, the, 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 you, you cannot guarantee uh, uniformity and the things that they need. Uh, 2007, we kind of get uh, based on that first uh, uh, equipment fund. Uh, fund we increase, we uh, bring the LVCV in, uh, Thai Star, and uh, also bring the several you know, PCV in. Now that's what we uh, have. And I, I say the film uh, uh, deposition part is uh, okay, not high quality. One of the uh, 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 good part is the LD part. I would say I would probably. We have a very good even LOD process. One of the reasons is uh, uh, Professor uh, Ray Gordon, uh, considered as like the father of the uh, LOD. He's that is across our uh, street. Basically, he has about more than twenty, you know, uh, LOD system in his lab. Okay, he gave us uh, the lots and lots of uh, uh, support. So with that kind of uh, uh, capability, LOD they they here we uh, it. Uh, it allow us to build some uh, very spe special you know, process. Here is a metal lens, original uh, metal lens, uh, how the metal lens built. And uh, the process group basically start with uh, like a EBD thermography and then uh, use uh, LOD to fill up the titanium oxide. And then, uh, uh, and then the partially the surface uh, uh, away and then uh, it make this uh, nano thin you know, um, metal lens. So, the charge, okay, that's uh, before two, 2006. You see what we have, very poor, right? So only uh, probe station and very simple, simple tools. Now we have a full uh, bandwidth, right? So from the electric property, uh, property the optical property, and the CD measurement, the mechanical, and the SPN, and the nano spectrum. Especially not the uh, SPN. I start to build the SPN labs uh, in 2006, and uh, brought four uh, systems in. Asylum and uh, Vico and uh, uh, VHAC. And after uh, Bill, uh, Bill jo uh, joining, he, because of his uh, research interest is uh, mainly on the uh, optical microscope, so he continue you know, enhance his uh, area. Now we have uh, eight you know, systems in these uh, uh, SPN lab. 
Now, for the SPI, for us, it's not only just the imaging. Basically, we use the SPI as a nano uh, platform to do the force mapping, uh, manipulation, and cutting, and uh, all the different kind of uh, Im uh, imaging, uh, mag magnetic or uh, kinetic, and even the uh, spectrum. So that's uh, we will continue, you know, enhance this area. Uh, this chart basically uh, show you the two usage distribution for different areas, right? Uh, see, apparently, patterning they take a big portion, about the 20, uh, 30 percent, and the film. Uh, PPD always uh, take about a big portion, about uh, plus the, uh, about the 30, uh, one third uh, plus the uh, CVD part. RE, RE side uh, monthly usage over uh, also over one uh, one thousand. We have several workhorse. Let's say uh, electronics, uh, the even even side is the usage number is uh, huge. Okay, both uh, both uh, uh, you will know, contribute about uh, eight hundred. Uh, almost, uh, 700 you know, uh, hours, and uh, the waiting list usually is about uh, two weeks. So that's the uh, that's the reason we kind of uh, uh, want to, you know, bring the second, uh, third, you know, uh, high-end uh, uh, system uh, in the lab. And the MLA is uh, another good example. Okay, we have two, but, but both uh, uh, both system is uh, is uh, over uh, 500. But we don't have a C uh, CMP. We don't have uh, electrical plating uh, implementation. We don't have uh, the imprint, uh, imprint, uh, imprint. So we still try to catch up. Okay, but the major uh, limitation here, major challenge, is that we don't have space. You know, we cannot find any space outside or inside the canal to uh, uh, to host the, uh, those equipment. Now, the uh, one of the questions uh, you may uh, you may ask uh, how we get the uh, equipment from, right? So here, uh, based on the original uh, capital base, okay, uh, like another fact, we got four million and uh, seven million uh, before two thousand seven, and then we kind of built a kind of, uh, a base, and then after that, uh, after two thousand, I'd say twelve, uh, uh, 12 uh, Harvard basically, you know, uh, give the uh, seniors about two million you know, capital money every year. Okay, so it allow us to, to uh, catch up, but uh, that's the stop at the 2014, uh, and then the, yeah, reduced to, uh, to one million, and then uh, to uh, zero during the pandemic, and now it's back to, <laughs> uh, back to one million. Another result, okay, interesting, okay, is uh, after uh, Bill uh, joined in, he managed to uh, get approval from the school to uh, allow, uh, allow us to get the annual a leasing budget about 500k. So uh, that uh, basically we we can uh, evaluate our working holes. Okay, those are very busy tools. Uh, we uh, we just go to uh, lease some uh, second in the tool. Okay, so right now, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a helps a lot. And uh, also we hungry. We basically see, see any other kind of uh, possible resource. One is uh, uh, we have very actively about the MRI. Uh, uh, funding and uh, uh, for example, the nanoscribe is uh, one of my MRI you know, uh, program. Uh, and uh, some faculties also uh, donate the startup or the uh, equipment to the, the center, but uh, occasionally. And uh, also, we kind of uh, have a good relationship with uh, the uh, vendor <laughs> side. Sometimes they give, give, give us uh, send a uh, demo system uh, to our site and uh, even. To, to, to uh, let us to open to the users. Another part is okay. Some uh, a big user industry uh, users to give us some uh, donation. For example, recently uh, Amazon Amazon kind of uh, built a content initiative. You know uh, that in uh, in Boston basically give us about three million uh, uh, comments. But uh, and also we have uh, very some talent. You know, they love to build the tools. So we we even build the tools by ourselves, like an LD. We build, build our uh, LD, we build our uh, zinc fluoride etcher and the 2D material assembly, even the UV exposure system. Uh, and occasionally, also, we get uh, get some funding, a special fund, uh, program from the school. For example, recently, we got the 300K <coughs> uh, to, uh, for the teaching you know, equipment. Uh, after uh, 2010, we had all replaced about 15 million you know, uh, 
technical equipment to uh, not affect. Well, uh, another question basically uh, uh, answer uh, uh, wants uh, wants uh, uh, asked this morning. Say, how, what's the procedure uh, to acquisition? Now, here is our, uh, for most of uh, uh, equipment in uh, uh, acquisition, here is our typical uh, procedure. So, uh, the key point here is, uh, okay, we try to uh, not, uh, certify not only one user, basically, it's uh, multiple users, okay? This, the, the, the second is, uh, that tool will bring the, the supposed will bring the new capability for new uh, research, right? Um, so usually it's a start from the uh, research, uh, research side, a uh, faculty side, they, 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 uh, they get some information from the vendors, or from the papers, and then they want to you know, buy a new uh, new tool, and then they kind of go to the top manager and or go to uh, my, my site and they discuss this possibility. Uh, possibility. We form up a, a proposal and uh, so try to get the uh, uh, top you know, uh, management's you know, uh, approval and also allocate a budget. And then we uh, back to the vendor side. Of not only one, uh, basically, uh, school rule uh, uh, required at least uh, three vendors. Okay, we, we will uh, talk to the three, three vendors. And the more important is to generate this sample and uh, uh, process demo process. So typically, we were going to give some uh, uh, basic uh, specification or from the user side, directly uh, from the user side, and what's the spe uh, specification uh, they, they are looking for. And then work together and make this uh, uh, sample and the process in a demo. So sometimes it's very uh, strict. I, I, I'm pretty sure uh, some of you, some vendors have already uh, passed this kind of uh, uh, process. Eventually, we uh, collect all those data and then form a evaluation report and then select one, right? So this uh, cycle-wise is kind of, you, you feel it's kind of uh, slow, but I'd say uh, uh, lots of benefit. The first, okay, uh, during this uh, process, okay, so you, you lock your, 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 uh, your user, basically, all, all those uh, uh, factories or the research group, you know, follow your data, agree, uh, that's the best, you know, tool for, uh, for, the, uh, for the research. And also, uh, it's not only benefit to one user, basically multiple uh, users, right? <coughs> and uh, uh, same, uh, same time, basically, we, we uh, build up all those uh, process, okay? So you kind of guarantee your usage on that tool. That's another uh, important part. <coughs> now, so here, uh, see, we, we kind of handle, let's say, a big user uh, base here. The big challenge is how do you make sure in such a small clean of the, the sp space the operation is uh, safe and uh, efficient and uh, uh, also high quality. Okay, so we uh, we kind of built a this kind of tri base you know a model uh, maintain, uh, maintenance uh, training and the process development. Okay, so probably it's not new for a lot uh, lots of you in uh, your mind, but. Uh, uh, Think about this uh, big user uh, community. Okay, so there is some uh, challenge out okay. here. For the maintenance part, it's not only just the installation and uh, fix the tool, but uh, we all, uh, we, the uptime, okay, uh, the very hard in the requirements is uh, the 90%. Okay, very timely uh, response and uh, need to provide the, 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 the uh, stable and the reliable you know, support uh, timely. And also we kind of, uh, you know, ask uh, also bring the SPC, you know, concept from the uh, industry into the, this clean room and they, they build this kind of uh, uh, the baseline, uh, process baseline maintenance in you know, standard. And also uh, we request, <coughs> we, we uh, build the fixed in you know, PM schedule for all the, all the two uh, tools, especially uh, chambers. And uh, uh, we ask uh, equipment engineer to be able to, you know, push the tool capability. So just keep in mind in the horror in the uh, so many uh, users, we you you will you will get a lot of crazy question, crazy you know, uh, you know project. They want to push the, the, the limit. Okay, so we, we need to know for us we need to know what's the limit. Okay, we give them some flexibility to push. <coughs> That's part. Now the training, uh, the, the, this uh, uh, maintenance is given, and uh, the training is a. Uh, uh, another uh, another part uh, right now it becomes very important. I'd say my uh, staff, my staff, uh, more than forty percent 
uh, especially the uh, uh, process engineer side, more than uh, forty percent of the time you know spend on the on the training. So the training here is not only just you know operate the tool itself. Okay, now it's uh, not not so simple. Basically, during training, we uh, we uh, need to teach the users the the the, the, uh, the, the uh, principle and uh, the basic process and some the tool you know, troubleshooting uh, skills. And uh, so we have a different uh, levels, so the basic level, uh, advanced level, and uh, also some special you know, assistant level. Okay, so we believe, okay, you uh, so, uh, most solid in the training uh, quality uh, better, you may basically you save you a lot lots of time. Okay, you don't need to worry about too much, you know, on the, on the tool fixing uh, that, that, that part. The training, we put a lot of the effort there. I would uh, 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 give a more, you know, and another part is uh, in, uh, in process development. Process de uh, development over here. Um, so, uh, and the research uh, environment. So that's kind of probably a uh, little bit new for uh, lots of us uh, side part. Uh, well, probably you don't have the kind of enough the benefits from the uh, stuff uh, on that part. But we do agree it's uh, important. Uh, well, basically, the uh, process, uh, process and the training is a kind of interface with uh, the users, right? So the uh, staff should have a capability to uh, build this uh, process baseline for the, for the tool, know that the, the tool that the technology will work, and then can uh, work with the maintenance side. And uh, also, uh, during the interface with the, the student, okay, they, they, they should have the capability to solve, to provide the solutions, and the process-wise to, uh, to, to the students. So basically, that's the, the way you, you generate the trust between the uh, staff and the, the faculty side. And uh, you, you, you just, uh, just uh, keep in mind, all those students will, will, uh, will leave eventually. So eventually, the staff is the uh, know-how person. So basically, they hold the most, of, uh, most of the information. And also, the uh, staff, uh, staff should have the capability to, uh, to push the, the tool capability. And also be, if uh, beyond the, the tool capability, they should have the capability uh, 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 able to you know find the new technology in the market, right? So basically, they can involve in the new tools searching and even some research development. Okay, so you you can again here this part, this two part is uh, directly interface with the users. Okay, to uh, face all those uh, uh, large you know user uh, demand. All right, so uh, based on that, you know uh, uh, three base. Okay, so uh, we formed uh, this team, we uh, uh, structure our team, and for different area, for different uh, patterning, etching, film, metrology, scanning, uh, SPM, and uh, 2D material. So ideally, I, ha uh, I would set, uh, have a one process engineer deal with uh, the training and uh, process development and the research environment, and also I have a equipment engineer that get in, in that area, good at that area to support the and uh, of course, we have uh, also the general uh, 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 facilities uh, support. Okay, like uh, Steve is the, the leader of that uh, uh, this part. And but what well, uh, we have uh, is uh, 15 you know, technical staff is not enough, honestly, based on uh, the user number and the usage we uh, we generate in the lab. And uh, for uh, uh, I'd say, fortunately. Most of my uh, staff came from, you know, uh, industry and they carry, you know, huge uh, you know, uh, ex uh, experience from the industry. So basically, they can. Uh, uh, other, so some of them also have a uh, pre uh, PhD uh, degrees and uh, have been working in the academic, you know, for uh, uh, long, long enough time. So, but anyway, we need more, uh, more staff. So if you uh, if you look at the uh, like uh, Stanford, Cornell, uh, Georgia Tech, they, uh, the the uh, figures they are talking about the twenty about nineteen probably you need more people definitely right so yeah we are kind of happy but uh, at this point it's not easy to find the uh, good people if you look at us you you feel superior <laughs> so, right. so uh, but Cindy. Right now, it becomes a big challenge, right? Uh, we kind of use a, a T and R mode, okay? T training, 
Okay, we put a different level of the training at front. Okay, we believe we truly believe the training, the good the training will uh, save, uh, save lots of the, uh, efforts. And the training basically, uh, safety training uh, from the building safety training, criminal orientation, web uh, bench uh, training, and also for the uh, individual tools safety training. Okay, different level. The monitoring is based uh, here uh, is kind of a tricky part, and um, we have an ERT team and we have a safety officer, so the data uh, we ask them uh, basically uh, the, 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 the daily you know, monitoring the uh, uh, check out. And uh, also we have a, like a DGMS system, I think it right now it will adapt for the uh, different you know, sites. And well, uh, another part is the material control, material control, okay. So we allow people to bring the, uh, uh, the material, uh, the, the own material, but uh, under the, uh, after the, uh, the, the approval uh, procedure. So the EHS you know, officer and the two owners need to e evaluate all this uh, material they're going to bring in the clean room. And uh, another point, okay, we have a camera, uh, camera uh, system. So school allow us to have this kind of a camera system, usually it's a, it's a tricky part, okay. But for, our, uh, for us, this camera system is only for the safety. The safety. So what we, we we don't have uh, like a daily monitoring. It's only uh, time. Only time we use that is uh, something happens in the clean room, and we need to uh, check what's going on. Right. So uh, the the last part is the response. So uh, we have the ERT team. Uh, so basically, uh, a of my uh, <coughs> uh, the staff. You know, involve, uh, form up with the ERT team with the uh, uh, e e e EHS, you know, officers, and uh, basically we kind of all the uh, all the team members get the train up uh, as a first uh, operation uh, level uh, based on the OSHA standard. Uh, used to be the uh, hazard material technician level, and uh, so we can we can carry the uh, SCBR inside. But now we kind of uh, uh, change. We just. Uh, Low uh, our uh, level down to uh, first uh, operation level, and uh, res basically the main responsibility of the uh, ERT team is uh, to respond to the toxic gas related issues and some uh, uh, chemical spill and other uh, incident uh, extent. And uh, well, we uh, every month we have a training. We have a training uh, uh, practice. See, this is uh, the, the 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 training uh, use uh, SPR. Well, uh, back to the training part. Okay, before 2010, uh, be, uh, before we uh, applied the new, uh, new, uh, new operation mode, and uh, uh, I, re uh, re re I realized, okay, the training is very so important. My, myself, okay, uh, that time I spent uh, uh, spent more than 50 percent of my time on the training for different tools, uh, for photo, uh, photo, photo side, uh, the charge side, and the backend side. PM size. And uh, now, uh, here, that's the, our weekly training uh, co uh, course open uh, to, to the uh, user side, and uh, more than 50 you know, uh, courses uh, every week. And, and also, well, right now we have uh, 100, uh, more than 170 uh, uh, pieces of uh, equipment, and we kind of generate this uh, training flowcharts. So from the safety training, they go to different about. So uh, especially you, you think about that some users from uh, uh, with, without any without any uh, uh, clinical experience. So you need to train them up, you know, uh, quickly. So that's a kind of a challenge uh, task. So basically, okay, we uh, we have a different level after the safety training. We uh, also put the uh, introduction for different in the technology side and let them know, to talk to the, the, uh, the users uh, individually uh, to uh, try to learn what kind of a, a purpose. And then we kind of give them the suggestion, okay, don't, don't go to, uh, go to the uh, Ionics, maybe MA6, good enough, right? So, but well, people always uh, pick up, okay, oh, that's, uh, that, that tool is fancy, let me, let me get the you know, uh, 50 KB uh, Ionics system, All right? But it's not necessary, right? So, but the training at the time is also long. So basically, we kind of smooth out uh, this uh, training uh, with uh, this kind of flow chart. And also, we have a, a another level is advancing the uh, process in the training. Okay, when when people uh, generate enough, you know, uh, two time, and uh, we go go further and uh, help them uh, on the process side. 
So that, that we, we thought that the, the, the uh, user side and the staff side are basically <coughs> engage in retyping. Okay, so. Uh, the, for the training side, okay, the main goal is we try to you know, make this training uh, <coughs> uh, very uh, efficient. Okay, one, we have a two weeks ago, let's say, uh, once you enroll into the CNS you know, uh, user program, uh, within two weeks, suppose you have something to run, to play, okay, in the playroom. And again, it's a 50, uh, uh, 50 <coughs> weekly uh, training course uh, available on, uh, and also you can uh, register online, and we have different levels. So in that year, uh, that year, so we kind of uh, uh, produce, uh, produce a more than uh, 35, you know, 100, you know, uh, training activity. Right now, it's uh, maybe even more, actually, because we have more uh, <coughs> tools. Okay. Another part is the process the baseline. The baseline, that's uh, uh, the, the process, uh, my process, uh, process engineer uh, main uh, task. Basically, for each tool, uh, we, we set, uh, set up the baseline. And for, the, uh, each, uh, for the, uh, here is uh, this uh, uh, big list uh, here. For example, uh, this one is uh, for the oxide uh, process, uh, LVCVD. And based on this uh, uh, recipe, uh, suppose you will get the, uh, the what kind of uh, actual property and uh, optical property. Okay, that, uh, this baseline also help us to check the, uh, the conditions of the tool. All right, if, uh, uh, if uh, the baseline off, uh, my, my technician, my, uh, my process engineer, every uh, they have uh, the uh, baseline checking schedule. If uh, the, uh, the baseline off, okay, that, that means the, the tool is off. We, we uh, bring the uh, equipment engineer in and then uh, fix. But sometimes it, it is uh, it is uh, it feels it's okay. It is the the, the RF power is still fine, but the the the, uh, the film quality is just off. That means that something uh, you know happened. So we, that's the point. We you know open the, the chamber and then do the cleaning and then uh, uh, diagnosis the, the issues. Uh, other than the the uh, tool and the process training, and also we have other you know. Patient the teaching support. For example, every uh, summer, uh, every summer we can open the notification some school, and uh, it's open to uh, public. And uh, okay, it's, it include about ten to twelve, you know, class, and every class about 90, uh, 80 to ninety uh, people uh, sit in the in the big room. And also we uh, every uh, every year we uh, uh, hold about thirty IU and uh, IVs students in the clinic. For different project, and uh, the, uh, the the seminars, the workshop, and the symposiums is uh, uh, happening at, uh, for uh, whole year, and uh, also we uh, even have uh, some uh, scholar programs for graduate and uh, postdocs, even the junior faculties. Okay, so uh, we will manage to get some uh, funds from the SF to to uh, to do that. And the reason that we heavily involved the uh, school uh, fact related class. Okay. So one is example. Uh, one example is uh, ES 177. This is a uh, microfabrication uh, lab uh, laboratory, and uh, the uh, <coughs> the professor is uh, uh, Evan Hu, uh, and also uh, Mark Ronka. Okay. So before the pandemic, before the pa pandemic, this class happened in uh, in the teaching lab, very small uh, lab. And with some uh, very old e equipment, and uh, students, you know, can doesn't have any uh, uh, didn't have any chance to uh, play the the tool by themselves. Or the TF show the process for them. Uh, after the uh, pandemic, the, the teacher not being uh, close, and then uh, having asked me, uh, so it's possible to you know put in uh, into the uh, CS. But um, that's a big challenge for us because the CS is uh, so busy and the traffic is uh, so heavy. And uh, but uh, we kind of find find some way find some uh, some way and uh, modify the curriculum uh, modify the structure and uh, allow every student have a chance to uh, play the play the, uh, the, the the tool and uh, make the device for themselves. So here, for example, the, uh, this class uh, the, the class uh, the, the uh, student need to make the four devices from the the Shopee uh, diode and the LED and the photo uh, detector and. Uh, Finally, it goes to MOSFET. It's a very complicated uh, uh, you know, uh, structure, 
and now last year it's a 26 students. So you, you can imagine it's a very, very big, very crowd, uh, crowded, right? But we make that make it happen. Uh, because of the uh, because of this uh, success of this class and uh, provost bas uh, ba uh, basically uh, award this class about 300 you know, k for the uh, teaching to do, uh, 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 teaching uh, funding to get some uh, teaching uh, tools and uh, so that's that's uh, going on and also because we uh, you know generating the pro new new protocol to support this kind of class. And all the class also try to use the same, uh, same mode. mode. Well, it's a kind of challenge for us. Well, if uh, if we have uh, three, three, uh, two class or two, uh, three, three class at the same time, that that's uh, generally the traffic uh, a lot. Now, right, uh, right now, we kind of push uh, the school side to uh, allow us to build a teaching app around the uh, clinic. All right. So finally, I will go to uh, well, the, the last part. I will go uh, the, uh, to the, the research direction and the uh, scientific theme. So basically, well, here the science, uh, the matter of fact, they support a different kind of area, right? And originally, I say uh, traditionally we were pretty good at the soft material and the flexible uh, electronics. But in the past uh, ten years, okay, the, uh, these three uh, photonics, quantum physics, and the two D materials are getting very hot. Okay. Uh, so I will, uh, in, I will use uh, several uh, examples to, uh, to, uh, to show you how we, you know, support this kind of uh, uh, research and uh, make the uh, some make the uh, unique, you know, platform for those uh, direction. And one is uh, diamond. Uh, diamond, diamond engineer uh, or uh, diamond uh, color uh, color center engineering. Okay, that's a start uh, at about two thousand. A 2009 and Marco uh, group. Marco at that, that time originally they, they basically use uh, etching in a polishing uh, uh, approach, uh, uh, polishing like a two thousand uh, dollars, you know, uh, wafers down to uh, a couple hundred uh, nanometer, and then make the uh, uh, light emitter uh, over there. So that's the original uh, the process. Now, uh, two, uh, let's say 2012, uh, to, uh, that, that time. They basically uh, try to uh, use a, a fiber cage, that, uh, the, the shadow uh, etching uh, process, and uh, we try different tools, uh, the, the different etching, uh, etching tools, and uh, finally make a kind of prototype uh, working. But of course, it's not uh, perfect. And then we continue investing uh, that uh, that uh, the, the, the process. Uh, so basically, we find a one to give the best, you know the. Uh, the results. So here we are talking about we are, uh, we are talking about the sidewall roughness and uh, the, the profile control, and also combined with uh, the uh, e beam patterning, you know, uh, process together. Now it uh, it becomes a platform for the current, you know, quantum networking and the sensors, you know, uh, application. Uh, recently, uh, also uh, like uh, uh, Amazon, you know, uh, uh, collaborated with uh, with several. Uh, groups in the harbor, uh, harbor side to generate this kind of uh, content network uh, initiative, and uh, they, uh, they form a engineering team about eight people, uh, have we use our uh, Kino and also give us, uh, give us a, uh, a couple million you know, dollars to uh, open more batteries for the diamond uh, process. Another example is uh, uh, thin film discography. Uh, uh, no, the thin film is uh, on you know, the, uh, the, uh, diesel nitrate is kind of a strange, you know, material, and the CMOS, you know, uh, line kind of hate that kind of uh, just a bit because of diesel. And uh, but uh, uh, thin film uh, diesel, uh, 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 thin film uh, uh, diesel nitrate. Okay, so this process also started from let's say two thousand two. Uh, Marcos group, you know, uh, pushed uh, that. Uh, Know, that make the uh, wave guide uh, the, the resonant, even though the uh, hardware is not first you know, the, uh, the site to make this kind of resonant, but uh, hardware is the first site to uh, find the full process to uh, produce a high Q and uh, actually uh, low loss you know, uh, resonant. Because, uh, because of this uh, process and uh, other emitters, uh, other uh, switches and uh, modulator, modulators and uh, cones structure, 
is enabled uh, in the in the in CS. CS. Now it's basically they, they move uh, move on, try to build this uh, platform, and also integrate with uh, a diamond in a, in a, a content emitter or division, and they try to in integrate that together. That's a, a for like say uh, following five years. That's a big you know the direction we're pushing. Uh, the third one, uh, metalness. Okay, I uh, show some. Uh, some processor use a uh, film deposition, use uh, a uh, LD originally, uh, use a LD process to make that happen. And then now the, the, the uh, capacitors uh, group make the, the, the device bigger and bigger. Now here, uh, they even f uh, uh, found a outs uh, outside the foundry, uh, outside foundry make the eight inch you know, wafer here. And the same device, well, not, not only uh, published uh, in this uh, science paper, but also they go to the real production. And uh, recently, uh, Google uh, new phone, they're going to uh, uh, use their uh, metal lens in their camera system. So other, uh, other part is uh, the, the 2D material. And uh, of course, it's after you know, uh, MIT you know, colleagues and uh, Professor pa uh, Pavlos in you know, a uh, group, uh, they found this kind of the magic, uh, uh, magic angle uh, of a 2D material. And then uh, in Harvard, we have uh, also several uh, groups, like the King Group, uh, Philip King Group, and the Yakobi Group. And also for CS, kind of we absorbed those uh, some uh, uh, 2D material assembly in you know, technology, and they try to build the, the labs, and hopefully we can open this uh, uh, facility to the other users, uh, so that the student uh, doesn't need to uh, doesn't need to spend a half year, you know, use uh, tapes to, to to make the device. Okay, so impact. Okay, so the paper always uh, the big uh, you know, uh, output. Uh, I, I say uh, outcome of uh, from the decision uh, center. So we uh, give a very brief calculation. Uh, during these uh, eight years, we calculate the top ten user uh, user uh, the, the paper they published. And uh, here, the, uh, for those are the top ten users, they published about uh, twelve hundred. You know. Uh, Papers and the citation of those papers is uh, almost uh, fifty uh, thousand, and the average uh, cite, uh, cite for, uh, for each paper is about four forty. And another uh, index we kind of evaluate out the index is uh, how much money you know uh, acquired or uh, founded uh, based on because of the CNC support. So in uh, fiscal year uh, seventeen, okay. Uh, Again, we only count the top 10 uh, people. And uh, well, basically, we, uh, it's about $21 million in uh, award from the uh, government agent. OK, 30% from the DOD. All right, so the last uh, uh, part I want to uh, mention is the connection with the industri industry. I'd say, uh, at the beginning, I, I, I mentioned Okay, about 15% of the user uh, come from industry. Okay, uh, of course, um, they, 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 uh, they from in the revenue part, they, they contribute a big portion. And uh, another part uh, is uh, uh, some uh, uh, science uh, has been uh, considered as the uh, demo site for main, uh, for new uh, te uh, technology instruments. And uh, I can name uh, name it here: Hasbro, uh, uh, Ironix, and uh, Silence, and others. And uh, and the uh, uh, most exciting part is uh, more than 20 you know, startup companies have been incubated from the CNS uh, in the past 10 years. Right? So that's the most uh, you know, uh, exciting part. Uh, kind of relationship with uh, the vendor side, I, will, I always say, OK, it should be a win-win situation. And you bring the new the technology here, I, uh, OK, to, to sit, uh, the, the uh, user side can can use a new technology for the new uh, push the the, the front uh, frontier of the research. Okay, that's the goal. That's the uh, goal of the uh, CN. Right. So you can consider here. Okay, for for CNS, basically we kind of uh, uh, connect all those uh, industry research and education together, and we are kind of uh, in the central port, the joining port. Okay, it's not only again, it's not only just the, the collection of the tools. So of course we uh, we are the, uh, in uh, the site in the NCI, and uh, even though we don't uh, get much you know money uh, like say money from uh, from here, 
and the, 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 the budget here is a kind of small uh, kind of our revenue. But uh, we enjoy, you know, connection. We ha have a lot of, uh, you know, share a lot of uh, experience and learn from, uh, from other sites. You know, we kind of enjoy this kind of uh, level. So with that, I will, let me stop here. And uh, you can always uh, visit us our uh, website and uh, visit us in the uh, Cambridge. And if you have any questions, uh, send, send me the email. Yeah, OK. Uh, I'd uh, like to take any questions you have. How do you, because uh, you do a lot of training, you also do research development. You also do a process, uh, kind of like a standard process for every company. Uh, yeah, we uh, for the uh, uh, most of I'd say uh, RIE, CD, and uh, photo science, we have uh, we have a baseline. We call it a baseline process to establish. Right. But you only have like fifteen staff. I, yes. I, I counted. You do have to offer more than two hundred training per person. Yeah, that's that's true. Okay, so basically, uh, you you're talking about yeah. How do you balance that? Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I'm asking. See that 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 point. Okay, so uh, that's the reason we kind of set up this uh, structure to uh, try mm -hmm. to uh, make sure a user can pick up the right tool to get the training, right? And for them, they kind of uh, you know shorten the, the training time. For us, also kind of you, we 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 uh, efficiently provide the, uh, the, the the training. Typically. Uh, my process uh, engineer, okay, they have a uh, fixed uh, schedule, the training schedule every week. Let's say Monday, uh, as I uh, show uh, the, the, the tables, and uh, they uh, open to the public. They kind of sign in, sign in. Some uh, some training is a group training, okay, so some, uh, uh, especially for the class, like an introduction part, and then. Uh, go to the group uh, training and then, but the certification will be one uh, one to one. Okay, that will be uh, separate. Okay. So, yeah, that's kind of challenge, I'd say. Uh, so, Jay, oh, sorry, yeah. JD, I'm over here. Yeah. Yeah. Quick, yeah, it's so really impressive how you've grown the the user base and the diversity of your user base as well. And I know from my time in NNCI that you have this large external group too. So, how do you balance the demand on? Your staff and equipment time between the external, the internal users in that case. Well, that's a, that that's a really good, you know, <laughs> question. Okay, it's an argument, lots of arguments, and uh, so basically, because one, once you have uh, the, the tool is getting busy, and the two groups are always fighting, right? And uh, especially the internal users, internal users will campaign, campaign. Okay, external users take uh, the, the two time, and then how, how do you, it's a big question right now. It's an argument. And one, one solution, I, I, I won't say we have a you know, final solution yet, um, but we are move, moving uh, uh, that direction. One is, okay, always, you know, get, if we're busy, okay, we get more uh, more tools, like uh, Alonix, <laughs> like uh, the, the, the even, uh, even writer. Another part is we try to uh, arrange the uh, scheduling priority for different group. For example, we uh, we uh, ask uh, external users, you know, fix their uh, book uh, the two time. Okay, to open up the uh, harder times uh, more flexibly uh, for the uh, external user. That's one of the direction. But uh, it will uh, solve the problem. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. Well, it really depends on you know how. Well, we, uh, especially right now, is we have a more and more the staff uh, staff company and you know, industry users. So uh, eventually, we, we we need to find a better, uh, other other way. I'd say. Yes, you you can send them across town to Dennis or something. <laughs> oh yeah, that's that's a great great, great part. And then uh, we we just talk about that. I'd rather you know send people uh, over there. Yeah. <laughs> you know my goal is to take all the users. Right? <laughs> <laughs> all the good ones. So we always have good ones. Okay. So. Yeah. Any question? Oh, anyway, I will be here if you have any questions. Like, uh, uh, the oh no, I didn't.
Good afternoon. Uh, I would like to thank you all for inviting me. I would like to thank you for being in the audience. Uh, as anticipated, my esteemed colleagues did an awesome job of covering a lot of aspects of the current design for education operation. I should be able to fly to my slides in half an hour or less. Uh, please feel free to interrupt me, ask me questions. If not, I will go very fast, and you may not hear or understand anything I'm saying. So questions are, are more than welcome. Uh, so the outcome of my talk, very simple. Uh, I'll talk about the clinics I helped build uh, throughout the years. Uh, I'll compare the Clinic in Western Delaware to the one in Western University of Pennsylvania. Then I'll talk about three projects that were related to my, my the Clinic I currently, op currently operate in the University of Delaware. Uh, so I was involved in designing and building or renovating four different cleanrooms. I started with a clean room at the University of Pennsylvania that was the existing clean room built in 1980s that was neglected for a while. Uh, the university got a nice donation from a gentleman by the name of Krishna Singh. Uh, although Penn knew that they were going to build the Singh Center for Nanotechnology, they decided to renovate the existing clean room for two reasons, well, for one main reasons. Penn already started hiring what I would call heavy hitters, rock stars in science, science and engineering, and they needed to give them a, a, a playground. Uh, the side effect of the movement of education facility was people like me and other staff who were involved in renovating the clean, we learned a lot. So by, by the time we actually went and we built the same set of technology, there were very few screw ups. Now there were some screw-ups by renovation of the old clean room, but we learned our lessons. And you'll see from the timeline, it took two years from the time the ground was broken until the clean room was actually certified in the University of Pennsylvania, so it just, it just went very fast. And then I moved to the University of Delaware. Delaware has been my home state for 20 years, so my commute is considerably shorter now, and there I was involved in kind of building and renovating a new clean room. I'll, I'll, I'll have some slides about that. Uh, and then our last project that I, I did there was to renovate part of an existing clean room and convert it into a teaching lab. So our teaching lab is in a different building, different lab, different staff. So my talk will focus about these two clean rooms. That's why I call it a, a, a tale of two clean rooms. So it's the Sink Center for Nanotechnology. Uh, the clean room there is 12,000 square feet. Uh, at the University of Delaware, the, my clean room is smaller, 8,400 square feet. It's compared to the clean room that Matt has, has, has a CMU, similar design. Uh, since I've been at Delaware for, for 10 years, I also was involved in some equipment installation projects. You can see the number of tools and the kind of money I was, I was able to spend there. Uh, so this is what the Singh Center for Online Technology looks at at the University of Delaware. This is not a real picture, but it's nice what the, the architects, architects are very good at doing. The, the building looks very much like this. It's a small building. It's, it's 72,000 square feet, but it's purely research. There is no office space for anybody. Well, there's some office space for the staff, but it's not like the PI self sitting space is there or anything. It's a two story building. Uh -huh. uh, the, it's L shaped. The clean room takes takes this, this, this part of the, of the L. It's on the first floor. The second floor about the clean room is the mechanical space for the clean room. They, they do not share the air, there's actually a piece of concrete in between, in between those two. Uh, the other wing is, uh, is the research labs, and there is this uh, cantilever that hangs over that it hosts a very nice conference room. Conference room. Uh, the story at the University of Delaware is different. It's the uh, interdisciplinary science and engineering lab. It's, the name sounds similar to what you guys here at AL want, want to build. It's an interdisciplinary, much, much larger building. Uh, it's U-shaped. Uh, this part of the EU, the left side and center light, is light uh, side is teaching. It's named after the DuPont company. Uh, the, the right side of the EU is the research, and it's called, named after the Gore company. Uh, the chemical campus in Delaware, and the clean room is uh, on, on the research side. Uh, this is just another view of the research sides on a not uh, so, so sunny day. Uh, this building is four stories tall. This is the layout of the, uh, of the clean room at the University of Delaware. So if I take this whole area in here, it's kind of square in size. It's 8,400 square feet. I show in gray the chase area, the areas that are not under the filters. Uh, it has, it's four bays, uh, uh, five chases. Uh, there's a sliding door in here, so everything on the left side is 
class 100, everything on the right is class 1000. Uh, the users come from the building to the governing room. There is a vestibule in here. They go into the clean room. Uh, we have uh, a gas room where we keep things that are corrosive and toxic. We have a bunker on the outside, and that's where we keep things that explode or, 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 or catch on fire. Um, layout at the University of Pennsylvania is a little bit different. It's more rectangular than the, the square. Uh, there is uh, more bays and chases. There is also a bunk on the outside, a gas room. Uh, so this clean room is mostly class 1000. So most of the white areas that you see in here are class 1000. The lithography areas, the one that has sliding doors and the entrance into the class 100 areas. There is still another area in here that's class 10,000. When I was there, it was supposed to be an area where you put dice and saws and wire bundles and other things like that, cut and connect printing. Uh, now it's actually uh, the, the soft lithography area. Uh, I have a table that compares pen and UD, so building size, I already mentioned that. The clean room at the University of Pennsylvania is a bigger section of the building, and also a very important one. The clean room was designed, the, the heart of the building was the, was the clean room. So everything was built around the clean room. We made sure, we made sure that the elevators in the building were not too close to the living photography room. Uh, the clean room at the University of Delaware is somewhere in the research wing. Uh, as you probably noticed from the layouts, the layout for the, the University of Pennsylvania is custom. It was based on a particular tool set. So we have different bays with different sizes. Uh, the uh, layout at the University of Delaware is more generic. When I got there, they told me they were building a NIST clean room. And Alex is no longer here, but that happened because during that 2008 financial crisis, oh, there you are, Alex. You know, uh, I think you were actually in charge of doling out some of those money, if I'm not mistaken. So there was NIST was actually offering somehow they was charged with offering money to build clean rooms and university across the country. Anyway, th that was the story they told me. So they were doing a NIST clean room uh, in terms of. Uh, the floor at the University of uh, Pennsylvania, it's a, it's a raised floor, and there's a little bit of slab on grade, and the University of Delaware is the opposite way, it's mostly slab on raised. Uh, there was some discussion about raised floor over just uh, slab on grade. I do prefer the slab on grade because I think it's, it's easier to live on. Uh, in terms of air filtration, uh, University of Pennsylvania had a combination of research units with the uh, HEPA filters connected to elephant trunks, and also the class 1,000 and 10,000 fan filter units, which I'm not a, not a big fan of, but somebody in my position can only accomplish so many things. And in Western <laughs> Delaware, it's different. Uh, we have plenums, pressurized plenums, and we have research units bolted on top of that. And also at the University of Delaware, the second floor of the clean room where the mechanical equipment is, it actually shares the air with, 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 with the first floor. I guess some places call interstitial space mezzanines. I just close them on the second floor. In terms of makeup air units, both facilities have two to makeup air units. None of them is fully redundant. The University of Pennsylvania is 75 percent redundant. The other University of Delaware is 50. Each facility, is, both facilities, have an exhaust and corrosive uh, exhaust system, corrosive and, so and a solvent. Each of them has a bunker and a gas room. Uh, the University of Pennsylvania has an acid neutralization system, which is very nice in Western Delaware, it doesn't. So we collect everything in bottles, and then we, we have a collection area here like, like, like Matt has, and we just we give, it, give them a PHS. Uh, fume hoods and gas equipment, they were installed at different phases in the project, either base build or tool install. I really have no strong preference. It's just, just, just whatever happened at that time. Uh, uh, in terms of design and construction, so we have different architects. We have different, uh, we have clean room engineers, MEP engineers. What I liked very much at Penn was that the same engineer was in charge of the clean room, the rest of the building. When you have that scenario, there is less chance of miscommunication, system mismatch, and so on and so forth. Uh, different construction companies. Uh, these two clean rooms, the design and construction, construction started roughly around the same time. Uh, and like I mentioned, the University of Pennsylvania, the clean room was finished about two years after the ground was broken. And in West of Delaware, it took a little bit longer to open, and I have more slides that have been involved into that. Uh, into that. Uh, when we uh, designed uh, the new climate pen, we actually spent the time to do kind of what you guys do here at Tail. We went and we talked to other places. We tried to learn from their mistakes. I'm not sure that that was done at the University of Delaware. Uh, 
Clinical staff involvement. I was there since the pre-design phase at the University of Delaware. I, I moved two years into construction. So I had a lot of tense sympathy for Dennis because he went there designed CD phase. I went two years into construction. So it was a little bit, little bit more difficult. Uh, it was kind of the challenge I was looking for, but I realized it was a little bit too much. Sometimes you have to be careful with what you wish for. <laughs> so it was, it was really rough, but I was able to get it done. Uh, the other thing that was nice at Penn, and uh, my boss was saying that this is clearly as clear room, and he calls the shots. And the rest of the other simply thrown to the water, and I had to swim and, and get, get things up. Uh, this is this, a picture of our mascot in here. It was one of our grand opening day in 2016. We see some graduate students who are very excited, <coughs> and very excited to have their own clean room, so they will not be an external user like I was when I was in grad school. I went to school in, in Orlando at UCF, and I was traveling to Cornell every other month, spending there two weeks getting, doing Bruce for fabrication, coming back to, to sunny Florida, and sometimes I would just come pretty much empty-handed because there was no time to, to, to check in with me. Uh, again, I'm going back to the layout of the clearing. What I want to show here is that most of the clearing is slab on gray. There's this area in here in Bay 3 that has a slide in there. That's the we been in photography area. We actually had to build a, a new home, a special home for that tool, and all the things we did was to have a raised floor in this, in this area. And to deal with vibration, we, we have to you know, basically cut out the floor and put the TMC vibration isolation plates. Uh, a general comment in, I know there are some folks from, uh, from, uh, from, from Rafe in here. What we found out, we spent so much time and money trying to meet the temperature specifications. And we were able to go only halfway, which turned out to be just great for the tool. The tool, tool works just fine. So we're trying <laughs> to just you know, meet the specs when we actually half of the, half of the requirement is, is just good enough. Uh, so I, this is just showing in here kind of a, a cartoonish cross section of one of the bays. We have air that returns on the side of the walls. We have about one foot of openings. It's slab on grade. Then we have the research units that collect the air. They push into the pressurized plenum to the HEPA filters. There is a, this, is, this is supposed to be the makeup area. It just brings fresh air from the outside. It's obviously not in the space. It's somewhere actually. We have a penthouse on top of the building. And it shows in here there's some exhaust. And there are some folks in here to be, appear to be cooking. So this is just, they're busy. That's the, that, that's the idea. So uh, we have 15 research units. Their job is to control uh, temperature. The spec is 69 plus or minus 0.5 degrees. The two tunnel uh, makeup air units, their job is to control humidity. So 45 plus or minus 2%. It took me years and years to reach this point in here, 2%. I actually had to rip out the existing humidification system and put a new one, which is actually based on a pressurized system. So you can actually have valves that control pressurized statements than the other way it's done. Uh, corrosive system, I have four fans. They're not the, the, the I don't remember the name of the, the big fans. I just, they're just small. That's why I have four of them. And I have a solvent exhaust here. Uh, this is what the clean room looked like when I set foot there on November 2012. So what you see in here, these are the pressurized plenums. They're already in place. You actually see this is a piece of ductwork work that was supposed to serve a fume hood. It's already in place. Uh, what you see in here are all the utilities in the chase. And the construction company was waiting for the floor to dry so they could put that compound levels it and then put on top of it, put the uh, static dissipating the floor in. Uh, so this is just a timeline. Now I'm focusing on my current was the Delaware that I, I currently run. Uh, design started in 2009. Uh, one year later, the ground was broken. I joined in November 2012. The, the original plan was for the, for the clean room to be completed in June of 2013. What happened in June of 2013, my new basis of design was actually accepted by the, by the design team. So I went and rewrote a new basis of design. Uh, we had the building was kind of completed on time, uh, October 2013, grand opening for the building. University of University of Pennsylvania was open roughly around the same time. Uh, so what we did uh, as we were building the existing clearing, we also started the process for what we call the phase one tool install. So we kind of run those projects concurrently. So on, on, on around uh, April 2014, we ordered the, the most of the phase one equipment. 
something happened, the very interesting that happened in uh, May of 2015, one week before the agreement was to be certified, just one week, uh, the <coughs> leadership of the university changed. And the question arose, is it worth for us to spend this kind of money in the clinical after the clinical was just one week after being certified? So <laughs> tens of millions of dollars had already been spent on the clinical. Uh, I, I never knew how much a clinical cost, but I hear $50 million, it's kind of a good ball, ballpark. But it just, just uh, anyway, so what happened, uh, our financial models were being stress tested during that time. So we were on hold for about uh, one month. Obviously, all of us, the staff, already had job offers from somewhere else because it was unheard of, anything like that. Univers the University of Delaware's motto is there to be first. So this would be in falling line. They would be the first one to shut down and clear. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. There were researchers. The researchers you know, made a lot of noise, and we went and we talked, and we convinced everybody to stay. So one month later, the Korean, the Korean was certified in uh, June, of, June of 2015. Uh, uh, a few more things up, uh, about the base field. Uh, I think I heard someone in the morning saying that this building would be the first lab building in 50 years on campus. It was in 20 years at the University of Delaware. So I thought that was. Uh, so another challenge was that the project manager who was assigned by facilities, he did not have the kind of experience needed for this kind of a complex building. Uh, facilities, there was no such thing customer service attitude for it. I came from Penn and things, things were a little bit different there. Uh, like I said, I was thrown into the water right away. Uh, we unfortunately had different MEP designers and clinical designers. There was some miscommunication, sizing mismatch, materials mismatch inside and outside of the clinical. The, the, the good things were that the academic side was willing to spend the money to get it right. So they just told me, just go and review, tell us what, what this thing should look like. Uh, faculty leadership was very supportive. The, cons the construction team was awesome, really good, a lot of experience. And I had an awesome EHS director who helped me a lot. Uh, some of you may remember a lot of the emails I sent during that time asking for advice. I did a lot of benchmarking, so that, that, was, that was very helpful. And persistence. This is something that my boss at Penn was saying. Persistence is a virtue. So just I took that advice and I, I ran with it. Uh, so this kind of compares not before means what I found, and after is what, 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 I, what I accomplished. So there was no utility metrics at the University of, uh, of Delaware. They, I couldn't find any gas, <coughs> chemical, or tool list. There is no tool, no tool layout. Uh, the gases were supposed to be in a, go in a gas room. I added a bunker because that gas room was not able to support the pyrophorics. You heard a lot, a lot talking about occupancies. I found a B-class B class clean on my current in H5, and some of you may appreciate what that takes to do all the fire ratings and all, all, all those walls and everything. Uh, there was no high, high purity nitrogen system. <coughs> now I have one that's, I, like, like Matt does at Carnegie Mellon, I purify some of the boil off from the liquid nitrogen tank, that's how I get my high purity nitrogen. Uh, the process cooling water plant was shared with the building. It was copper, but there was another, a lot of iron in the components. And one of the screw-ups in the University of Pennsylvania was the process cooling water system. So I knew there is no way we can allow iron in our process cooling water system. So now I have a dedicated system. Uh, it's uh, stainless steel, and my piping is CPVC. So that's the one that Dennis mentioned, CPVC being it in a way that kind of makes me nervous. My system has been up running for several years, so it seems to be OK. There was no process cooling water, no process vacuum for the cleaning. We shared with the building. Now I have my own system. The clean dry air was shared with the building. I added a membrane dryer to reduce the dew point. Uh, <coughs> the corrosive exhaust was 10,000 CFM, expandable to 15,000. When I say expandable, it means that we would have to add, physically add more exhaust fans later on. I convinced people this is not a good way to do it. Let's just put exhaust fans on now, now so we, could, we just turn them on later. Uh, so I expanded 24,000 CFM. It was only polypropylene. It, uh, I got some support to actually convert half of it into the coated stainless steel. Flammable exhaust, 10,000, expand to 15, expand to 15,000 CFM. Power, that was a big issue. I had, at the end of it, uh, 
chase, I had a 408 volt panel and a 208. And 408 is just it's way too much. The only reason I had 208, 408, I'm sorry, uh, 480, it's because of the, the lights that they run around to 70, 270 volts. So I converted a lot, most of them to 208, added an emergency generator. Another issue we had, you heard a lot, talk, a lot talking about EMI, is that all the conduits that were feeding the power panels in the back of the base, all of them somehow ran under the room where the building photography tool was supposed to go. So what we did, actually, we took all the conduits, and now they run 30 feet above the, above, above the floor. And you know, the TMI drops like the cube of the distance of stone and so forth, so things are a lot better. You heard a lot about TGMS. When I got there, there was a basic system that was supposed to support just a handful of oxygen depletion system sensors. I have now I have a very nice backbone that's, that can take a lot of points, and it's, it, it's very, very robust. So the, the major comment between Penn and UD was since at Penn, that's where kind of I cut my teeth and I learned a lot. By the time I got to UD, since I had the money and the support, my claim is very robust. I mean, small, but it's, it's very tough. Uh, the next project was the phase, first phase one tool installed, 27 tools, $7 million, about $4 million to install. So the approach we, I, we have at the University of Delaware is we hire somebody to give us drawings for the tool install. We hire a construction manager. The construction manager hired trades and they did the work for us. So what, what the only thing we do is, is supervise. Uh, it took about uh, over two years for the, for the tool install project from the design phase until it was actually done. Uh, it took about one, one year to issue the RFP for the design team and hire somebody, do the same thing for the, for the construction manager, and also go through all the, all the bid project process. The construction took about uh, about nine months, uh, and I'm saying here's the second mobilization after suspension. Uh, when they, the crane was suspended, actually the trades for the tool install, not for the base, but were already on site. So they had to go away, we had to bring them back. Some of them were not available. But anyway, it took nine months from the, from, from, from the, the, the time we restarted. Uh, some challenges, uh, the construction management team employed the bait and switch approach. The people we talked to, the people we did scope, they had prior experience, they had built fabs and so on and so forth. What we got on site was the experience that they had was to build high scopes. So that was a, that was a challenge. Uh, also, we had the same uh, inexperienced internal project manager, the suspension I already mentioned. Another challenge was EHS was not familiar integrated integrating uh, equipment with TGMS and firearms systems. So even though we presented them all the drawings, we gave them time to review, they allowed us to have the UVR sensors from the gas gamut and the, and the VMB integrated with the toxic gas monitoring system. Once everything was done, then when they came to inspect the site, they decided, no, this is the wrong way to do it. So we want the UVR sensors to be tied into the firearm system. So that took some rework. So even though we, uh, we opened the clean room at the beginning of 2016, in March, it took us eight more, th more years, more, no, sorry, more weeks, more months, until the tools that depending on the TGMS could actually be used. And that was around the time that Lauren joined UD, so it was all good for her. Uh, again, we had the nice things. We had a great, great designer uh, that did the design for the tool install, and we, the clean room staff, simply took over the project management. And we kind of acted as, as, as the construction manager. Uh, this is what the, uh, Bay One looked after the Phase One tool install. Uh, this shows uh, Paul with his with his ICP etchers, and this is the the, the the back of the ICP tools with all the nice toxic gas monitoring system, the sensors, the disconnects, the pumps, the chillers, the, the, the tubing, and so on and so forth. Phase Two tool, Phase Two of the tool install, uh, about 1.3 million dollars to buy equipment, about 1 million dollars to install them. Uh, this time we actually we were able to hand pick the designer, the construction manager, and the trades. And the project only took six months from design until it was done. Uh, we didn't have a qualified internal project manager, so what the university did, we did was to hire an external competent project manager who was unfamiliar with the UD bureaucracy. And he obviously, being a non UD person, he didn't have access to a lot of the systems that, that, that the UD person would have. Uh, Great designer, great construction manager, great tradespeople, and great union staff. Which is, uh, in this in this case, we didn't even we just we just we just did the, did the project management. Uh, 
So for the phase one and phase two, th there were two separate buckets of money. One was to buy equipment, the other one was to install it. The acquisition cost kind of shows on my books somehow, although it was kind of it was zero out. The installation cost came from somewhere else. I never knew where it came from, and I was happy not to ask. Now, after the phase one and phase two ended, the way it works now, we install one tool at a time. And this time, we have to pay for both the acquisition and installation. So I, I have, when I request permission, I have to give a total number with best, get, best guesses on. Well, I know how much the tool costs for installation. It's, it's always an indicated guess. We always handpick the design and the trades. As long as we stay on, I think there's a limit, like 50K or 100K. We can just pick whatever we want. We don't have to go for competitive bidding. Uh, I have a great relationship with facilities. We, UDNF, the staff act as a, as, act as a construction manager, and the internal PM assists us with, with bids and things that you know I don't have access to in the university system. Uh, this is my last slide. So some lesson I learned uh, in this uh, in this journey of mine for the last 15 years is, and I'm sure you know just by Young having us here, you guys are already doing it so in great shape. So talk and, and visit other university clinics. Get the clinic staff involved very early. Give the clinic staff authority. Like, like Dennis mentioned, I built these two clinics, and the, the way I always looked at it, I don't know what the future holds. I would, my plan was to retire from Penn until somehow I heard that you know, there's something a lot closer to home. So I knew I, I had to live with whatever I was building. That was my attitude. And like Dennis said, yes, you're a, con you're a construction company where a project architect and engineer, you have schedule and cost, but I have to live with it. So please you know, respect my, my needs as well. And Dennis used the word rash. I think I was something worse at times. Uh, but I knew I had a mission. I know that my researchers wanted a nanofab clean. And that's why I, I try very hard to deliver. Uh, make sure you have a list of uh, tools, gases, chemicals. Have a tool layout. Have a utility matrix. If possible, hire the same engineer for both clean, clean design and yeah, MEP. If not, pay very close attention to coordination, like like Deb, like, like uh, Dennis mentioned. You have to make sure that pipes do they meet each other inside and outside the clean. There is no conflicts and so on and so forth. And very important, do not value engineering the clean. You heard me saying uh, amen at some point this morning. When I went to UD, the architects, the engineers were telling me, Julian, all these great things you want, they were somewhere in the drawings. They got that engineering out. Because if you look at the building, what's the most expensive part is the clean room. And that's the easiest way to cut. Not only the clean room itself, but you take all the ultra pure water system out and all the, all the process cooling water and so on and so forth. Uh, so that's all my last. The last of my slides. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> if you have questions, I would like to answer them uh, now or later. Yes, Matt. So you mentioned uh, in the UD clean room that you had to have a uh, emergency generator added. So what does that uh, generator support? OK, so yes. Uh, initially, the, clean, the building has had two generators. Uh, when we lose power, what we do to the clean room, which is the most critical part in the clean room, we reduce the airflow and the exhaust to half. It turns out that those two generators were not capable of doing that. So I have a third generator, which does very, something very, very funny. So I have my makeup air units and two exhaust systems. One is corrosive, one is, one, one is solvent. The existing generators of the building, they are able to hand, uh, support my, air, my makeup air unit and one of the exhaust systems. I don't remember which one. Which one. So the other exhaust system is on the, on the other uh, exhaust fan that I added, on the, the other emergency generator that I added. So we didn't have enough capacity to hold, to hold the clean room positive during, during a power outage. And just a quick follow-up. So when, if power is uh, to go out, do the air handling systems ramp down to a minimum speed? Half. Half? Okay. Yeah.
Yeah, basically, uh, right now we kind of have that uh, issues. Based, okay, our building uh, doesn't have enough, you know, power generated backup. So only some I can only put some uh, uh, critical equipment uh, on backup. So that's uh, yep. that's not good. I guess I can yes, uh, add to that from uh, from this polar's perspective with our uh, backup generator. So we've got a one and a half megawatt backup generator for the building. For all of the labs, all of the exhaust air and supply air gets cut in half. But for the clean room, all the makeup air and all the exhaust air are all fully <laughs> backed up. But we lose all of our research air. So we're basically able to protect the, pressurize the plenum and have full exhaust. Look, full, full on the makeup, uh, but half. I think I hit the right button. Uh, yeah, so the uh, no, the, the makeup air stays on, and uh, and each unit's at roughly 50%, so we also have redundancy there as well. And then the uh, the exhaust air also stays on at, at its full normal value, but the research air of, of just going around, that gets cut out. And, of course, the, you know, the theory behind that is just, well, keep it pressurized so it stays clean and then keep it safe by keeping the exhaust on at, the, at its full amount. Okay. Any other They also they also on, on UPS power. So I have UPS is that are backed up by the emergency generator. So those tools, those two tools, they always on. So for for instance, we have our uh, our toxic gas monitoring system is on, uh, is on the backup yeah. generator with it yeah. with its own UPS to carry it over for the 10 second for the transfer. Uh, I think there's there's something in the MBE that uh, that keeps something warm for a little bit too. We are looking at uh, putting in a uh, a clean room wide UPS to be able to carry maybe around 10 minutes. Our uh, utility in Boulder is, is great at losing power for a few seconds or maybe even 10 seconds. Uh, it's, it's really good about keeping power for, uh, for, for longer periods. We maybe, maybe once every year or two, we lose power for more than 15 minutes. So we're looking into that power upgrade. As another side note, we was, uh, our space was designed with the incorrect power uh, uh, rating. The, uh, the panels were all 300 watt, 200, 208, three phase panels. And, but the, um, uh, the transformer that fed them were 75 kVAs <coughs> instead of 100 and, 100, 112 and a half kVA uh, transformers. So that means that the actual current that goes to the panel is really more like 207, 208 amps. So when our safety engineers discovered that, we lost a third of our power just at the snap of a finger, and we keep adding too many tools, so we need more power. So that's a whole other thing. So thinking about what the what the power loading is and how many tools you're really going to stuff in there hence that idea of the of the tool pitch how many tools do you think you can get in there so you're required by code to have uh, one four cubic feet of CF, cfm of air to move for every square foot of space you have in the h5 so you get one from exhaust and three from research so if you go to a hundred percent makeup air plus a hundred percent exhaust Cut all your, your research off. I mean, does code let you not have that research? Because that's why you don't have to have it electrically certified. You get four cubic feet per square foot. So, is it because it's emergency that you don't have that those three cubic feet? Um, let's see. So we so the the plant is still pressurized and air is still moving around. So we get about fifty thousand cfm of air on the makeup air going into the space, and then another fifty thousand coming out to be non plant certified. Yes, uh, yes, four. Right, we're about 10,000, uh, We're about 18,000 square feet. No, so, so um, I mean, when the power is off, I mean, people can't do anything anyway, so no, it's no, mostly just, yeah. certification thing for electrical, electrical certification. certification. So if you have an H5 and you you have to have four cubic feet to not be certified, like if you get uh, Div 1, Class 2, Class 1, Div 2, right? You have to have four cubic, you have to have that all emergency, all uh, explosion proof. Because you're in a class one div two, so to get around that, from by the code, it lets you put four cubic feet per square foot. Three of them have to be research to not be certified electrically. So if you see, so that's why typically you go to fifty percent because you can't 
you have to keep the research going for the code, for safety, and the 50% is the trade-off. So you have 50% makeup, 50% exhaust, and then you keep your research going because you need to keep that certification. But I never looked into the code during an emergency, right? In other words, when you're in emergency power, do they right. do you get relieved on that three cubic feet? I would, I would assume so. I mean, when, when we lose power, I mean, maybe somebody goes in there to, you know, check on things or something like that. But most of the time, I mean, the space is cold. There's nothing you can do anyway. You wait till power comes on and, you know, start the restart procedure. But yeah, I'll, we should chat about that. I'm, yeah. I'm curious. I'm going to go back and look because <laughs> I have to, because basically, you know, when you're balancing all the power, the generators, basically, you know, for us, I break up the two pieces. The one, first is, one part is the code requirement mm -hmm. that you have. And then the second part is your equipment, your tools, your instrumentation and so forth. Um, right. And so, you know, I'd love to have battery backup. I don't know if you, there's been quite a bit of work done now with uh, UPS battery backups. I think the um, uh, Gulf, University of Gulf in uh, Netherlands, they actually have a complete battery backup now. So they use batteries for everything to get you through those bumps. Yeah, it's, it's sort of what we're what we're looking at. It's in the design phase right now, so we don't have a kind of a the, we don't have anything set, and I need to find the funding for it too. To be honest, so it's a whole other yeah, piece. I'll look back. Maybe maybe we're cutting our research too. I'll have to look at that. I didn't realize that the research was getting cut. Maybe they aren't getting cut. So we go to fifty fifty. Yeah. Then we cut. Maybe the research is getting cut too. The battery. I break them up into two pieces, right? So you've got some, you got legally required, yeah. you get the three levels for emergency power, right? Now, if you have extra and you want to put other things on those circuits, you can. That, uh, not until everything else gets powered up first. Uh, but typically what you do is you have either flywheel or the battery to support the other equipment in the laboratory. And then you have to have those circuits in there, right? You can't use the same circuits. You have separate circuits that are for UPS. Now it's uh, five, exactly 5.01, so I think uh, it's about time that uh, we should uh, probably head to dinner. Uh, we have another hour to, uh, if you want to continue the discussion. Uh, I would like to take uh, one minute uh, just to thank all uh, guest speakers. They did a great job uh, for educating us, and uh, yeah, I couldn't imagine a better panel for uh, addressing how to build a new clean room. I hope that idea actually start to confuse you a little bit and make you think twice before you build a new clean room. Thank you all.